Part 5. Patriotism, A Menace to Liberty, from Anarchism and Other Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anarchism and Other Essays by Emma Goldman. Patriotism, A Menace to Liberty. What is patriotism? Is it love of one's birthplace, the place of childhood's recollections and hopes, dreams and aspirations? Is it the place where in childlike naivete we would watch the fleeting clouds and wonder why we too could not run so swiftly? The place where we would count the million glittering stars, terror-stricken lest each one and I should be, piercing the very depths of our little souls, is it the place where we would listen to the music of the birds and long to have wings to fly even as they to distant lands? Or the place where we would sit at mother's knee, enraptured by wonderful tales of great deeds and conquests? In short, is it love for the spot, every inch representing dear and precious recollections of a happy, joyous, and playful childhood? If that were patriotism, few american men of today could be called upon to be patriotic since the place of play has been turned into factory mill and mine while deafening sounds of machinery have replaced the music of the birds nor can we longer hear the tales of great deeds for the stories our mothers tell today are but those of sorrow tears and grief what then is patriotism patriotism sir is the last resort of scoundrels, said Dr. Johnson. Leo Tolstoy, the greatest anti-patriot of our times, defines patriotism as the principle that will justify the training of wholesale murderers, a trade that requires better equipment for the exercise of man-killing than the making of such necessities of life as shoes, clothing, and houses, a trade that guarantees better returns and greater glory than that of the average working man. Gustav Hervé, another great anti-patriot, justly calls patriotism a superstition, one far more injurious, brutal, and inhumane than religion. The superstition of religion originated in man's inability to explain natural phenomena. That is, when primitive man heard thunder or saw the lightning, he could not account for either, and therefore concluded that back of them must be a force greater than himself. Similarly, he saw a supernatural force in the rain and in the various other changes in nature. Patriotism, on the other hand, is a superstition artificially created and maintained through a network of lies and falsehoods, a superstition that robs man of his self-respect and dignity and increases his arrogance and conceit. Indeed, conceit, arrogance, and egotism are the essentials of patriotism, let me illustrate. Patriotism assumes that our globe is divided into little spots, each one surrounded by an iron gate. Those who have had the fortune of being born on some particular spot consider themselves better, nobler, grander, more intelligent than the living beings inhabiting any other spot. It is therefore the duty of everyone living on that chosen spot to fight kill and die in the attempt to impose his superiority upon all the others. The inhabitants of the other spots reason in like manner, of course, with the result that from early infancy the mind of the child is poisoned with blood-curdling stories about the Germans, the French, the Italians, Russians, etc. When the child has reached manhood, he is thoroughly saturated with the belief that he is chosen by the Lord himself to defend his country against the attack or invasion of any foreigner. It is for that purpose that we are clamoring for a greater army and navy, more battleships and ammunition. It is for that purpose that America has within a short time spent four hundred million dollars. Just think of it. Four hundred million dollars taken from the produce of the people. For surely it is not the rich who contribute to patriotism. They are cosmopolitans, perfectly at home in every land. We in America know well the truth of this. 
are not our rich americans frenchmen in france germans in germany or englishmen in england and do they not squander with cosmopolitan grace fortunes coined by american factory children and cotton slaves yes theirs is the patriotism that will make it possible to send messages of condolence to a despot like the russian czar when any mishap befalls him as President Roosevelt did in the name of his people when Sergius was punished by the Russian revolutionists. It is a patriotism that will assist the arch-murderer Diaz in destroying thousands of lives in Mexico, or that will even aid in arresting Mexican revolutionists on American soil and keep them incarcerated in American prisons without the slightest cause or reason. But then patriotism is not for those who represent wealth and power. It is good enough for the people. It reminds one of the historic wisdom of Frederick the Great, the bosom friend of Voltaire, who said, Religion is a fraud, but it must be maintained for the masses. That patriotism is rather a costly institution, no one will doubt after considering the following statistics. The progressive increase of the expenditures for the leading armies and navies of the world during the last quarter of a century is a fact of such gravity as to startle every thoughtful student of economic problems. It may be briefly indicated by dividing the time from 1881 to 1905 into five-year periods and noting the disbursements of several great nations for army and navy purposes during the first and last of those periods. From the first to the last of the periods noted, the expenditures of Great Britain increased from $2,101,848,936 to $4,143,226,885, those of France from $3,324,500,000 to $3,400,000. Four hundred and fifty five million one hundred and nine thousand nine hundred, those of Germany from seven hundred and twenty five million two hundred to two billion seven hundred million three hundred and seventy five thousand six hundred, those of the United States from one billion two hundred and seventy five million five hundred thousand seven fifty to two billion six hundred and fifty million nine hundred thousand four hundred and fifty. Those of Russia, from 1,900,975,500 to 5,250,445,100. Those of Italy, from 1,600,975,750 to 1,755,500,100. And those of Japan, from 182,900,500 to 700,925,475. The military expenditures of each of the nations mentioned increased in each of the five-year periods under review. During the entire interval, from 1881 to 1905, Great Britain's outlay for her army increased fourfold. That of the United States was tripled. Russia's was doubled, that of Germany increased 35%, that of France about 15%, and that of Japan nearly 500%. If we compare the expenditures of these nations upon their armies with their total expenditures for all the 25 years ending with 1905, the proportion rose as follows. In Great Britain from 20% to 37, in the United States from 15 to 23, in France from 16 to 18, in Italy from 12 to 15, in Japan from 12 to 14. On the other hand, it is interesting to note that the proportion in Germany decreased from about 58% to 25, the decrease being due to the enormous increase in the imperial expenditures for other purposes, the fact being that the army expenditures for the period of 1901 to 5 were higher than for any other five-year period preceding. Statistics show that the countries in which army expenditures are greatest, in proportion to the total national revenues, are Great Britain, the United States, 
Japan, France, and Italy, in the order named. The showing as to the cost of great navies is equally impressive. During the 25 years ending with 1905, naval expenditures increased approximately as follows. Great Britain, 300%, France, 60%, Germany, 600%, the United States, 525%, Russia, 300%, Italy, 250%, and Japan, 700%. With the exception of Great Britain, the United States spends more for naval purposes than any other nation, and this expenditure bears also a larger proportion to the entire national disbursements than that of any other power. In the period 1881 to 5, the expenditure for the United States Navy was $6.20 out of each $100 appropriated for all national purposes. The amount rose to 660 for the next five-year period, to 810 for the next, to 1170 for the next, and to 1640 for 1901 to 5. It is morally certain that the outlay for the current period of five years will show a still further increase. The rising cost of militarism may be still further illustrated by computing it as a per capita tax on population. From the first to the last of the five-year periods taken as the basis for the comparisons here given, it has risen as follows. In Great Britain, from 1847 to 5250. In France, from 1966 to 2362. In Germany, from $10.17 to 1551. In the United States, from 562 to 1364. In Russia, from six dollars and fourteen cents to eight dollars and thirty seven in italy from nine fifty nine to eleven twenty four and in japan from eighty six cents to three dollars and eleven cents it is in connection with this rough estimate of cost per capita that the economic burden of militarism is most appreciable the irresistible conclusion from available data is that the increase of expenditure for army and navy purposes is rapidly surpassing the growth of population in each of the countries considered in the present calculation. In other words, a continuation of the increased demands of militarism threatens each of those nations with a progressive exhaustion both of men and resources. The awful waste that patriotism necessitates ought to be sufficient to cure the man of even average intelligence from this disease. Yet patriotism demands still more. The people are urged to be patriotic, and for that luxury they pay not only by supporting their defenders, but even by sacrificing their own children. Patriotism requires allegiance to the flag, which means obedience and readiness to kill father, mother, brother, sister. The usual contention is that we need a standing army to protect the country from foreign invasion. Every intelligent man and woman knows, however, that this is a myth maintained to frighten and coerce the foolish. The governments of the world, knowing each other's interests, do not invade each other. They have learned that they can gain much more by international arbitration of disputes than by war and conquest. Indeed, as Carlyle said, war is a quarrel between two thieves, too cowardly to fight their own battle. Therefore, they take boys from one village and another village, stick them into uniforms, equip them with guns, and let them loose like wild beasts against each other. It does not require much wisdom to trace every war back to a similar cause. Let us take our own Spanish-American War, supposedly a great and patriotic event in the history of the United States. How our hearts burned with indignation against the atrocious Spaniards. True, our indignation did not flare up spontaneously. It was nurtured by months of newspaper agitation, and long after Butcher Weiler had killed off many noble Cubans and outraged many Cuban women. Still, in justice to the American nation, be it said it did grow indignant and was willing to fight, and that it fought bravely. 
but when the smoke was over, the dead buried, and the cost of the war came back to the people in an increase in the price of commodities and rent, that is, when we sobered up from our patriotic spree, it suddenly dawned on us that the cause of the Spanish-American War was the consideration of the price of sugar, or to be more explicit that the lives, blood, and money of the American people were used to protect the interests of American capitalists, which were threatened by the Spanish government. That this is not an exaggeration, but is based on absolute facts and figures is best proven by the attitude of the American government to Cuban labor. When Cuba was firmly in the clutches of the United States, the very soldiers sent to liberate Cuba were ordered to shoot Cuban workingmen during the great cigar maker strike, which took place shortly after the war. Nor do we stand alone in waging war for such causes. The curtain is beginning to be lifted on the motives of the terrible Russo-Japanese War, which cost so much blood and tears. And we see again that back of the fierce Moloch of war stands the still fiercer god of commercialism. Kuropatkin, the Russian minister of war during the Russo-Japanese struggle, has revealed the true secret behind the latter. The Tsar and his grand dukes, having invested money in Korean concessions, the war was forced for the sole purpose of speedily accumulating large fortunes. The contention that a standing army and navy is the best security of peace is about as logical as the claim that the most peaceful citizen is he who goes about heavily armed. The experience of everyday life fully proves that the armed individual is invariably anxious to try his strength. The same is historically true of government. Really peaceful countries do not waste life and energy in war preparations, with the result that peace is maintained. However, the clamor for an increased army and navy is not due to any foreign danger. It is owing to the dread of the growing discontent of the masses and of the international spirit among the workers. It is to meet the internal enemy that the powers of various countries are preparing themselves. An enemy who, once awakened to consciousness, will prove more dangerous than any foreign invader. The powers that have for centuries been engaged in enslaving the masses have made a thorough study of their psychology. They know that the people at large are like children whose despair, sorrow, and tears can be turned into joy with a little toy. And the more gorgeously the toy is dressed, the louder the colors, the more it will appeal to the million-headed child. An army and navy represents the people's toys. To make them more attractive and acceptable, hundreds and thousands of dollars are being spent for the display of these toys. That was the purpose of the American government in equipping a fleet and sending it along the Pacific coast, that every American citizen should be made to feel the pride and glory of the United States. The city of San Francisco spent $100,000 for the entertainment of the fleet, Los Angeles, 60,000. Seattle and Tacoma, about 100,000. To entertain the fleet, did I say? To dine and wine a few superior officers, while the brave boys had to mutiny to get sufficient food. Yes, $260,000 were spent on fireworks, theater parties, and revelries, at a time when men, women, and children through the breadth and length of the country were starving in the streets, when thousands of unemployed were ready to sell their labor at any price. $260,000! What could not have been accomplished with such an enormous sum? But instead of bread and shelter, the children of those cities were taken to see the fleet, that it may remain, as one of the newspapers said, a lasting memory for the child. A wonderful thing to remember, is it not? The implements of civilized slaughter. If the mind of the child is to be poisoned with such memories, what hope is there for a true realization of human brotherhood? We Americans claim to be a peace-loving people. We hate bloodshed. We are opposed to violence. 
yet we go into spasms of joy over the possibility of projecting dynamite bombs from flying machines upon helpless citizens. We are ready to hang, electrocute, or lynch anyone who, from economic necessity, will risk his own life in the attempt upon that of some industrial magnet. Yet our hearts swell with pride at the thought that America is becoming the most powerful nation on earth, and that it will eventually plant her iron foot on the necks of all other nations. Such is the logic of patriotism. Considering the evil results that patriotism is fraught with for the average man, it is as nothing compared with the insult and injury that patriotism heaps upon the soldier himself that poor deluded victim of superstition and ignorance, he, the savior of his country, the protector of his nation, what has patriotism in store for him? A life of slavish submission, vice and perversion during peace, a life of danger, exposure, and death during war. While on a recent lecture tour in San Francisco, I visited the Presidio, the most beautiful spot overlooking the Bay and Golden Gate Park. Its purpose should have been playgrounds for children, gardens and music for the recreation of the weary. Instead, it is made ugly, dull, and gray by barracks, barracks wherein the rich would not allow their dogs to dwell. In these miserable shanties, soldiers are herded like cattle. Here they waste their young days polishing the boots and brass buttons of their superior officers. Here, too, I saw the distinction of classes. Sturdy sons of a free republic, drawn up in line like convicts, saluting every passing shrimp of a lieutenant. American equality, degrading manhood and elevating the uniform. Barrack life, further, tends to develop tendencies of sexual perversion. It is gradually producing along this line results similar to European military conditions. Havelock Ellis, the noted writer on sex psychology, has made a thorough study of the subject. I quote, Some of the barracks are great centers of male prostitution. The number of soldiers who prostitute themselves is greater than we are willing to believe. It is no exaggeration to say that in certain regiments the presumption is in favor of the venality of the majority of the men. On summer evenings, Hyde Park and the neighborhood of Albert Gate are full of guardsmen and others plying a lively trade, and with little disguise, in uniform or out. In most cases, the proceeds form a comfortable addition to Tommy Atkins' pocket money. To what extent this perversion has eaten its way into the Army and Navy can best be judged from the fact that special houses exist for this form of prostitution. The practice is not limited to England, it is universal. Soldiers are no less sought after in France than in England or in Germany, and special houses for military prostitution exist both in Paris and the garrison towns. Had Mr. Havelock Ellis included America in his investigation of sex perversion, he would have found that the same conditions prevail in our army and navy as in those of other countries. The growth of the standing army inevitably adds to the spread of sex perversion. The barracks are the incubators. Aside from the sexual effects of barrack life, it also tends to unfit the soldier for useful labor after leaving the army. Men skilled in a trade seldom enter the army or navy, but even they, after a military experience, find themselves totally unfitted for their former occupations. Having acquired habits of idleness and a taste for excitement and adventure, no peaceful pursuit can content them. Released from the army, they can turn to no useful work, but it is usually the social riffraff, discharged prisoners and the like, whom either the struggle for life or their own inclination drives into the ranks. These, their military term over, again turn to their former life of crime, more brutalized and degraded than before. It is a well-known fact that in our prisons there is a goodly number of ex-soldiers, 
while on the other hand the army and navy are to a great extent supplied with ex-convicts. Of all the evil results I have just described, none seems to me so detrimental to human integrity as the spirit patriotism has produced in the case of Private William Buwalda. Because he foolishly believed that one can be a soldier and exercise his rights as a man at the same time, the military authorities punished him severely. True, he had served his country fifteen years, during which time his record was unimpeachable. According to General Funston, who reduced Buwalda's sentence to three years, the first duty of an officer or an enlisted man is unquestioned obedience and loyalty to the government, and it makes no difference whether he approves of that government or not. Thus Funston stamps the true character of allegiance. According to him, entrance into the army abrogates the principles of the Declaration of Independence. What a strange development of patriotism that turns a thinking being into a loyal machine. In justification of this most outrageous sentence of Buwalda, General Funston tells the American people that the soldier's action was a serious crime equal to treason. Now, what did this terrible crime really consist of? Simply in this. William Buwalda was one of 1,500 people who attended a public meeting in San Francisco, and, oh horrors, he shook hands with the speaker, Emma Goldman. A terrible crime indeed which the general calls a great military offense infinitely worse than desertion. Can there be a greater indictment against patriotism than that it will thus brand a man a criminal, throw him into prison, and rob him of the results of fifteen years of faithful service? Buwalda gave to his country the best years of his life and his very manhood. But all that was as nothing. Patriotism is inexorable, and like all insatiable monsters, demands all or nothing. It does not admit that a soldier is also a human being, who has a right to his own feelings and opinions, his own inclinations and ideas. No, patriotism cannot admit of that. That is the lesson which Buwalda was made to learn, made to learn at a rather costly, though not a useless price. When he returned to freedom, he had lost his position in the army, but he regained his self-respect. After all, that is worth three years of imprisonment. A writer on the military conditions of America in a recent article commented on the power of the military man over the civilian in Germany. He said, among other things, that if our republic had no other meaning than to guarantee all citizens equal rights, it would have just cause for existence. I am convinced that the writer was not in Colorado during the patriotic regime of General Bell. He probably would have changed his mind had he seen how, in the name of patriotism and the republic, men were thrown into bullpens, dragged about, driven across the border, and subjected to all kinds of indignities. Nor is that Colorado incident the only one in the growth of military power in the United States. There is hardly a strike where troops and militia do not come to the rescue of those in power, and where they do not act as arrogantly and brutally as do the men wearing the Kaiser's uniform. Then, too, we have the Dick Military Law. Had the writer forgotten that? A great misfortune with most of our writers is that they are absolutely ignorant on current events, or that, lacking honesty, they will not speak of these matters. And so it has come to pass that the Dick military law was rushed through Congress with little discussion and still less publicity, a law which gives the President the power to turn a peaceful citizen into a bloodthirsty man-killer supposedly for the defense of the country, in reality for the protection of the interests of that particular party whose mouthpiece the president happens to be. 
our writer claims that militarism can never become such a power in america as abroad since it is voluntary with us while compulsory in the old world two very important facts however the gentleman forgets to consider first that conscription has created in europe a deep-seated hatred of militarism among all classes of society thousands of young recruits enlist under protest and once in the army they will use every possible means to desert second that it is the compulsory feature of militarism which has created a tremendous anti-militarist movement feared by european powers far more than anything else after all the greatest bulwark of capitalism is militarism the very moment the latter is undermined capitalism will totter true we have no conscription that is men are not usually forced to enlist in the army but we have developed a far more exacting and rigid force necessity is it not a fact that during industrial depressions there is a tremendous increase in the number of enlistments the trade of militarism may not be either lucrative or honorable but it is better than tramping the country in search of work standing in the bread line or sleeping in municipal lodging houses after all it means thirteen dollars per month three meals a day and a place to sleep yet even necessity is not sufficiently strong a factor to bring into the army an element of character and manhood no wonder our military authorities complain of the poor material enlisting in the army and navy this admission is a very encouraging sign it proves that there is still enough of the spirit of independence and love of liberty left in the average american to risk starvation rather than don the uniform thinking men and women the world over are beginning to realize that patriotism is too narrow and limited a conception to meet the necessities of our time the centralization of power has brought into being an international feeling of solidarity among the oppressed nations of the world a solidarity which represents a greater harmony of interests between the workingman of america and his brothers abroad than between the american miner and his exploiting compatriot a solidarity which fears not foreign invasion because it is bringing all the workers to the point when they will say to their masters go and do your own killing we have done it long enough for you this solidarity is awakening the consciousness of even the soldiers they too being flesh of the flesh of the great human family a solidarity that has proven infallible more than once during past struggles and which has been the impetus inducing the parisian soldiers during the commune of eighteen seventy one to refuse to obey when ordered to shoot their brothers it has given courage to the men who mutinied on russian warships during recent years it will eventually bring about the uprising of all the oppressed and downtrodden against their international exploiters the proletariat of europe has realized the great force of that solidarity and has as a result inaugurated a war against patriotism and its bloody specter militarism thousands of men fill the prisons of france germany russia and the scandinavian countries because they dared to defy the ancient superstition nor is the movement limited to the working class it has embraced representatives in all stations of life its chief exponents being men and women prominent in art science and letters america will have to follow suit the spirit of militarism has already permeated all walks of life indeed i am convinced that militarism is growing a greater danger here than anywhere else because of the many bribes capitalism holds out to those whom it wishes to destroy the beginning has already been made in the schools evidently the government holds to the jesuitical conception give me the child mind and i will mold the man children are trained in military tactics the glory of military achievements extolled in the curriculum and the youthful minds perverted to suit the government further the youth of the country is appealed to in glaring posters to join the army and navy 
a fine chance to see the world cries the governmental huckster thus innocent boys are morally shanghaied into patriotism and the military moloch strides conquering through the nation the american working man has suffered so much at the hands of the soldier state and federal that he is quite justified in his disgust with and his opposition to the uniformed parasite however mere denunciation will not solve this great problem what we need is a propaganda of education for the soldier anti-patriotic literature that will enlighten him as to the real horrors of his trade and that will awaken his conscience to his true relation to the man to whose labor he owes his very existence it is precisely this that the authorities fear most it is already high treason for a soldier to attend a radical meeting no doubt they will also stamp it high treason for a soldier to read a radical pamphlet but then has not authority from time immemorial stamped every step of progress as treasonable those however who earnestly strive for social reconstruction can well afford to face all that for it is probably even more important to carry the truth into the barracks than into the factory when we have undermined the patriotic lie we shall have cleared the path for that great structure wherein all nationalities will be united into a universal brotherhood a truly free society end of part five